Hello, everyone, and a very warm welcome to you all. I am Nicolas Lemoyne, uh, and I'm in charge of the custom programs at HEC Paris. On behalf of the board of HEC Paris, our faculty and all our teams, we hope you are keeping well during these unprecedented times. As an academic institution, we believe that the current situation lends itself to reflection and that the best way for us to support you is to share the analysis of HEC Perry professors. So the presentation today, and maybe I'm gonna start by asking you to get ready with your phone for the one who are connected with a PC because we might need your support. So please take your phone uh, switch on your phone on the uh, 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 photographs on the camera, um, and uh, you will see later. Um, so the presentation will last about 30, maybe 40 minutes, and will be followed by a 15 or 20 minutes uh, question and answer session. There are many of you uh, with us today, but um, with the team, we will do uh, our best to respond to your question. So with us today, we have the pleasure to have Olivier Siboni, who is Associate Professor in Strategy and Business Policy at HEC Paris. And this afternoon, Olivier, uh, uh, you're going to speak about decision-making and cognitive bias, the COVID-19 example. And we also have uh, with us uh, Nicolas Boucater, um, who is the president for the HEC alumni community in Lebanon, and uh, Nicola um, will uh, join us at the end of the session. So, Olivier, thanks again for joining us today. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, Nicola. Welcome, everyone. Um, we uh, are going to be talking, as Nicola said, about decision making. It's always an important topic. It's an especially important topic in times of crisis. And we're going to try to illustrate some of what uh, the, the best current knowledge is about decision making with some um, ideas about the current situation in the world. But before we do that, actually, I'm going to ask you to explore how you think by playing a few games using your phone, as Nicolas said. So I'm going to ask you to look at these instructions, which I'm going to show you now. You can either aim your smartphone at the QR code, and if you've got um, a relatively recent smartphone, the, the photo uh, app, the, 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 the camera on your phone, should instantly recognize the QR code and get you to the right place. If that doesn't work, you can enter www.menti.com in your browser, not Mentimeter, just menti.com. And then when prompted, enter the code 1646276. When that is done, I'm going to give you a few seconds to do that because I can see some people fumbling with their phones. It's never as easy as it should be, but I'm sure it's going to work for all of you. As soon as that is done, I'm going to lead you to the first question that I want to ask you. And the question is, a very simple question. Relative to other people, how well do you drive? Imagine that the world is divided in four groups of drivers, the A drivers, the B drivers, the C drivers, and the D drivers, who are supposed to be four groups of equal size. Are you a top quartile, an above median, a below median, or a bottom quartile driver? I'm not going to show you the results just yet. It's intentionally hidden from the slide, but please answer and submit your answer. And once you're done with that, we will move to another question. Now, the second question is relative to other people. How well do you draw? Imagine again that the world is divided in four groups of equal size. The people who are the best drawers, the people who are next best, still above the median, but not as good, the people who are below the median, and the people who are the worst drawers, A, B, C, and D. Would you say that you're A, B, C, or D? And we will see the answers, of course, in a second. But before 
we get your answers to that. I've got a third question for you. And then I promise I will stop asking you silly questions without telling you why I'm asking you those questions. I will reveal why I'm asking you those questions. But um, the next question is about this little puzzle that you see here. What you see here is a railroad. And this is a railroad on a very, very hot day. And we're going to assume that there are two pieces of rail that are very long pieces of rail. They're about 1.5 kilometers long, and they haven't been properly nailed to the floor. And since it's a very hot day, they are pushing against each other in the place where you see the yellow arrow in the middle. They are expanding a little bit because of the heat. You see the metal tends to expand because of the heat. And where they haven't been properly nailed, they're going to push against each other and push up. And the question I have for you is, without actually taking a calculator, without, of course, making the difficult calculation that this implies, what is your intuitive estimate of how high the rails will go if they expand by three centimeters, knowing that they are 1.5 kilometers long, how high will they go? Or if you prefer, if you were to solve using the Pythagorean theorem, uh, what the equation tells you x is here, but of course, without actually calculating, what would you find? So what's your intuitive estimate of x in centimeters? Is it less than one centimeter, between one and three, between three and 10, or more than 10? And again, we'll see the results in a second. I'm giving you a second to think about this because it's not very easy. but presumably you've now all answered. So now that we've got a number of answers to those questions, let me tell you why I'm asking you those questions. Very simply put, it's because the model we have of how we think is actually not right. We've been taught, we've been told, we, we believe that the way we think resembles Rodin's thinker, the sculpture you see here, that when we've got to make important decisions, like the one you see around this page, we sit down and we think and we consider all the options. This is actually not a very good description of how we think. A better one is given by the world champion of chess, Magnus Carlsen, whom you see here. And Magnus Carlsen says, often I cannot explain a certain move. I only know that it feels right. I usually know what I'm going to play after 10 seconds, and the rest is double checking. If you've read Daniel Kahneman's book, Thinking Fast and Slow, which I'm showing here in the top right-hand corner of the slide, you are familiar with the term system one and system two, which is really what Magnus Carlsen is talking about here. System one is the fast thinking, the one that tells you, I know what feels right in 10 seconds. System two is the slow thinking, the one that does the double checking. System one is automatic, easy, effortless. System two is effortful, conscious, tiring, difficult. We all have these two ways of thinking and they interact all the time. This, by the way, is how we can do amazingly difficult things like cross the street. We think that it's very easy to cross the street, but actually, if you had to program a robot to cross the street, you would have to tell the robot, well, look at where the car is, try to estimate how far it is, try to estimate at what speed it's traveling, calculate how long it will take the car to get onto the pedestrian crossing that you're about to use. Meanwhile, also calculate how long it will take you to cross the street at your usual pedestrian speed. If you can cross the street before the car gets to the middle of the street, then it's okay, otherwise wait. Obviously, you don't do that. That's what a system two would need to do, but your system one doesn't need to do that. It just shortcuts to the answer. It takes a quick glance at the car and it just knows if it has time to cross or if it should wait. So your system one has evolved to help you short circuit, shortcut those very difficult problems. That's what it, the, 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 the term for what it does is a heuristic. A heuristic is a shortcut. It's a way to get to the answer without having to do all the problem solving. So. System one has heuristics that solve very complicated problems all the time and that serve us very well. We'd be very, very, very uh, embarrassed if we didn't actually have a system one to do those things for us. 
Unfortunately, system one can also be wrong. So here I'm going to travel back to the slide on which you answered those questions and we're going to discover together what your answers were. Here are your answers. You can see that actually this is a little different from what we have usually. The majority of you are somewhere around three centimeters. That's not unusual. unusual. But more of you are below three centimeters than above three centimeters. Very few of you, you can see 11% answer more than 10 centimeters. Now, this is odd because if I show you the right answer here, the right answer is actually 948 centimeters. So only 11% of you said it was more than 10. And it's about 10 times more than that. So what is very interesting here is that the distribution always looks a little bit like this. You can see that this is roughly the distribution that you had, right? M most people answer somewhere around three centimeters. And what is interesting about this is not that you get it wrong, it's that you get it wrong in a very directional way. Of course, you get it wrong if I ask you a very difficult question that requires a calculator and I tell you not to use a calculator. That is not surprising. What is surprising, what is interesting, what is a learning point here is that almost everybody gets this wrong in the same direction. This is an error that is directional, what you see on the right-hand side of the slide as opposed to what we would normally expect, which is a random error, what you see on the left-hand side of the slide. It's also a very large error. So when we make an error like this, that is very large and directional and predictable, it's called a bias. It's the sort of mistake that we make when our system one uses a heuristic to solve a problem that it's not very well equipped to solve. Biases are the flip side of heuristics we've evolved to use heuristics to solve problems and it worked fine and it still works fine for most of us most of the time but sometimes we make predictable mistakes called biases that's what cognitive biases are all about by the way this is distinct from um, gender biases racist biases all the biases that you hear about all the time they exist they are terrible we hate them but that's not what i'm talking about i'm talking about cognitive biases here. The fact that you answered three centimeters and not 948 centimeters doesn't make you a bad person. It's just a fact of life and it happens to all of us. So those are the biases that lead us astray. This one, for instance, is a consequence of something called anchoring. Your system one, when it has to answer a question to which it does not have the answer, just grabs the first number it can find. In this case, it was three centimeters because it was on the slide. That explains why three centimeters is a very popular answer and something around three centimeters is a very popular answer. Another example of a bias, and here I'm going to go back. It's not very easy. I'm sorry, I need to um, go back to the slide manually. I'm going to go back to this slide and I'm going to show you your answers. You can see that, as I imagined, 85% of you think that you are above the median. 85% of you think that you drive better than 50% of the population. Only 15% of you think that you are in the bottom 15% of the population. Now, obviously, that cannot be right. That is an overconfidence bias. That means that we overestimate ourselves. We overestimate ourselves on a lot of things. But as you, can, as you will see in a second, on the drawing question, I'm pretty sure, I could be proven wrong, but that would be the first time. I'm pretty sure that we are going to find the opposite answer. Let's find out relative to others, how well do you draw? Now we find that 73% of you believe that you are below the median and only 27% believe that you are above the median. So what we see here is a very interesting phenomenon where on many things like driving, and this is actually the vast majority of things, we overestimate ourselves. Let me go back to the right slide. If you ask people how good they are in school, if you ask entrepreneurs how good or how successful they think they will be, if you ask people who get married whether they have more chances of remaining married as opposed to getting a divorce than most people, people generally overestimate themselves, overestimate their chances in life. This is a very typical bias called overconfidence. But we also have the opposite phenomenon here, where in your case, it's about 20, 25% who think they are 
above the median. In general, it's about 20%. So the vast majority of people underestimate themselves. This is wrong too, but it's wrong in the opposite direction. What's going on here is that when we are faced with the question, how well do we draw? It's actually a difficult question. And we answer with a simpler question, which is what comes to mind most easily and how do I compare to that? What comes to mind when I ask you, how well do you draw? is not the lousy drawing that most of us in this call would actually produce. It's the great drawing that I was showing you or that you could see in a museum or that you see when you look at a magazine, you never actually see a bad drawing. So relative to the first thing that comes to mind, you're bad at drawing. And relative to the first thing that comes to mind when I ask you how well you draw, which is people having accidents, you are fortunately better because most of us don't have accidents very frequently. So what we're doing here, and it's important to understand the mechanism, is that we are actually not answering the question that is being asked. The question that is being asked is relative to other people, how good are we at these two things? That's a difficult question. Our system one doesn't like difficult questions. When faced with a difficult question, it replaces it with an easier question, which in this case is what comes to mind and how do I compare to that? And it gives us an answer that we confidently provide. And that, of course, is predictably wrong because substituting an easy question for a difficult one can only produce the wrong answer. So this is another type of bias. We've talked about anchoring. We've talked about overconfidence. This is what I call a mental model bias. We filter the questions that we face through the ideas that we already have in mind. The final type of bias that I wanted to alert you to is one that you've all lived through when you've been in a meeting. Suppose that this lady is making a presentation and she does what people usually do. Uh, she goes around the table and asks people what they think. And the first person you can see here says, yeah, let's go, let's do it. And the second person says, let's go, let's do it. And the third person says, let's go, let's do it. And the fourth person says, let's go, let's do it. And you're the lady at the right here. You're the fifth person. And you had some doubts at the beginning, but what are you going to say now? You're probably going to say, yeah, let's go, let's do it. And there is two mechanisms at play here, which are important to bear in mind. One, of course, comes to mind naturally, it's the social pressure, the conformity pressure that you know, makes us want to get along with the people before us. So if everybody seems to agree, let's not pick a fight. Let's just agree and you know, not make a fuss about it. There is something else, though, which is important, too, which is that if five of your colleagues believe this is a good idea, maybe they're right. Maybe they know something about this that you don't. Maybe their judgment is something you should take into account and you should heed their opinion. Only fools never change their mind in response to the opinion of others. So you are rationally adjusting your view to the views of others because you trust and respect them because they've done their homework, because maybe they're more competent about the topic than you are. So all in all, these two reasons, the social pressure and the fact that you rationally take into account the opinion of others, will lead to a phenomenon that I'm sure you've all observed called groupthink, which is that groups tend to converge on some ideas that are formulated early, especially if they are formulated by high, stat high status people. And that leads to a problem called groupthink. All these biases, uh, and many more, are systematic deviations from rationality that affect us all, not because we're bad, not because we're lazy, not because we are underqualified or incompetent, but because we're human beings. There are many more, uh, but these are a few, just to give you a flavor of uh, how this works. Now, why does this matter? Is it just about playing little games like this? Well, no. These biases lead us to make mistakes in the real world. And this is where I'm going to get into discussions about the real world. In your country, for instance, how well do you think the COVID-19 crisis was managed? Let's actually see your answer. Okay, let's have some more answers. Maybe you had turned off your phone because you thought my questions were over. I should have warned you. So you think it was managed about as well as in other countries, which 
I'm not surprised um, because in most countries where I ask this question, people tell me either about as well or worse. Very few people actually seem to think that their country did a good job. The reason is this is a very difficult problem to manage and uh, there are no obviously very, very good solutions. So let's explore for a minute how how biases, how the sorts of cognitive biases that I've talked about may have played a role in this. And just to be clear, they are not the only reason, there are all sorts of factors. I'm just using this as an example to highlight the role of cognitive biases. First of all, let's put ourselves back at the beginning of this crisis. This is the US and this is March 16. And 18 of the best epidemiologists in the country are asked by the website 538, how many cases of COVID-19 they think there will be on March 29, which is 12 days later. It's not six months later, it's not a month later, it's 12 days later. Each of the bars on the left is the estimate of an expert with a blue dot that represents the best estimate and a bar that represents the low and the high end of the estimate. What's interesting here is two things. First of all, they get this very, very wrong by being optimistic. On average, they say, on average, their consensus, which you see with the dotted line here, they say it's going to be 19,000. And 12 days later, the correct number is seven times higher. But more importantly, in addition to being too optimistic, they're also, with a few exceptions, massively overconfident. You can see that most of them have a very narrow range around the little blue dot, because when they, and it's, it's one thing to say, yeah, I think it's going to be 15,000, but it's quite another thing to say, and I'm sure that it's going to be between 14 and 16. That is a lot of overconfidence. And all the experts, apparently, with the exception of the three at the top there, were very, very overconfident in the sense that their confidence intervals were very narrow. This is, by the way, a mistake we all make when we are asked to formulate a confidence interval to say, how wide would you have to make your confidence interval to be 90% sure that you're correct? We tend to pick an interval that is too narrow. We tend to be too precise in our estimates whether or not those estimates are actually optimistic. That's a different issue. So we are overconfident in the sense of being overprecise. Anchoring is also at work here. Here's um, a French expert who has become famous, Professor Raoult, who has become famous among other things for, being, uh, for making pronouncements that turned out to be wrong. At the beginning of the crisis, he was saying, in a bad year, the flu kills 10,000 people in France, we're at 500, I'd be very surprised if it killed more than 10,000. Sadly, we're at 34,000 now, only a few months later. Uh, so he was very wrong. Why was he wrong? Not because he's incompetent. Obviously, he's one of the best uh, infectiology special, in, infectious disease specialists in France and probably in the world. He was anchored on the number provided by the flu, which turned out to be irrelevant. Six months later, another bunch of experts are saying, why are we taking all those measures, curfews and so on? You know, let's not panic. The epidemic is only killing 30 people a day, whereas it was 1400 a day in mid-April. The situation is now radically different. Again, they are anchored on the number that they choose to pick from April. Killing 30 people a day is not very good news if that number is doubling every day. As of yesterday, it was 166 and this was uh, about a month ago. So back in September, it was very clear that the number was increasing. What they should have asked is, what is the trend? As opposed to asking, what is the anchor to which I'm comparing this? If you were comparing this to an epidemic of the plague in the 17th century, it would also look very modest, but that's not necessarily the right comparison. So anchoring is, which we saw in our little example with the three centimeters, is also something that makes us make wrong comparisons from time to time. Another example of groupthink is provided by a lot of rumors and uh, fake news that are circulating about this. We tend to live in our little bubbles on the, uh, on the social networks and to fall prey to all kinds of rumors that are spread by our small circles. Inside a group, it's very easy for misinformation to spread and not to be debunked. Obviously, that's a big problem, not just about COVID, but about just about everything 
because of social networks. That in itself would, in my opinion, be a reason to regulate social networks a lot more. They are a big um, eco box for a lot of groupthink and for a lot of uh, bad information and bad rumors. And finally, something that was very striking when we went from normal life to lockdown and then from lockdown to normal life again, and in France, at least, this is happening again these days, is how quickly behaviors change as the behaviors of others change. When you see people behaving normally, it's very hard to believe that there is a threat. When the, th when the streets are empty, it's very hard to feel safe. The paradox, of course, is that when people were on March 15, all getting out in the street because on this picture, it looks very, very safe and you feel completely at ease, they were at risk precisely because there were a lot of them there. And when the streets were empty a few days later, of course, it's because it was prohibited to go out. But um, it would have been safe to go out precisely because there was no one there. Our system one judges danger and judges risk to a large extent by the behavior of others, by the group behavior of others, not based on a rational analysis of the situation. So all these things lead us to make mistakes. They also lead us to make mistakes. I'm going to skip this in the interest of time in business situations. But I wanted to emphasize this using examples from the news just because it's a little more striking. Just to check that we are um, understanding each other. And before I tell you what to do about these things, I'm going to ask you to grab your phone again and ask you to tell me how often you see these four types of problems that I've talked about in your organization. Would you agree, strong, answer strongly agree if you think this is often a problem, if you have obs observed it often, answer strongly disagree or somewhere towards strongly disagree if you think these are not a problem and we're going to get a sort of qualitative ranking of how often you see overconfidence, people being too precise, too confident in their forecasts, too optimistic, mental model biases, people looking at the situation through the wrong glasses with the wrong lenses, picturing the situation in a way that is not right, thinking they understand when in fact they don't, anchoring, being hooked on a number from the past which leads them to misunderstand or misconceive the current situation, and finally groupthink and herd behavior. Let's see if these happen often. You all seem to think that all of these, and especially herd behavior, uh, and to a lesser extent overconfident, are among the most uh, important, but obviously you are on the right-hand side of the picture with all of those. So you know what? You're right. These are real problems. These biases and many others actually influence the way we make decisions, including strategic decisions, not just in situations like the ones we've seen before, but in our businesses as well. Hence the question I wanted to very briefly touch on for you, which is what we can do about this. So to answer this question, maybe you've seen this picture before um, and you know that where square, the square marked A and the square marked B are, uh, it looks obvious to us that A is darker than B, but actually if you could see the animation, which unfortunately the technology on this particular tool does not let me show you, you would know that A and B are actually the same shade. It's only when I add the cylinder here, the, the green cylinder, that A and B appear not to be of the same shade. If you could see the animation, it would be easier. But trust me, you can also go to um, Adelson, uh, you, you can Google Adelson Visual Illusion and you will find a lot of animations and videos that show you this and that explain how it works. The point, and the reason I'm showing this to you is that you know that this is an illusion because I've now told you, but you are still a victim of the illusion. You still, your eye still sees A as darker than B. There is nothing you can do about that. Biases, the ones I've talked about, are just the same. Just because I've told you there is a thing called overconfidence doesn't make you able to escape overconfidence. Just because I've told you about groupthink doesn't make you better at escaping groupthink. Just because you know about biases does not mean you don't have them anymore. In fact, nothing you can know about biases is going to make you better at avoiding their consequences. What you need to do if you want to avoid their consequences is have a better decision-making process. And for an example of a good decision-making process, we should draw inspiration 
from the story of how Kennedy and his team lived through one of the greatest crises of the 20th century, the Cuban Missile Crisis. You may remember the story. The Soviets have started putting nuclear missiles on the island of Cuba, a few uh, tens of miles from the, the US Florida coast. And the question is, how do we deal with this? And for 13 days, as the world was on the brink of World War III and nuclear apocalypse, these guys in a room in the White House somehow found a way to extricate themselves from what would have been the, the worst situation, and in fact, the last situation the world would have had to deal with. How did Kennedy do that? Well, he did a lot of things like generate options more systematically, as opposed to just looking at the options that were given to him, getting intelligence from multiple sources, asking two people in the room to play the role of what he called the intellectual watchdogs, which most of us would call the devil's advocate, asking people to work without protocol as a team and making sure that people could change their mind and that they were in a climate where they could actually exchange ideas more freely than they normally would. All those things deserve a more detailed discussion, but basically, if you try to um, abstract what he was doing, he was making sure that they had good process and a good team, that they had collaboration, but also rules, that they had procedures and guidelines, things like making sure you have a devil's advocate, that doesn't happen by change, chance, and also that they had a great team. The thing here that is very important to take away is it's not enough to have a good team. It's not enough to have a diverse team. It's not enough to have people you trust. It's necessary, but it's not sufficient. You also need process to make sure that those people are going to express their ideas and to make sure that the ideas that they express are listened to and that after you've heard various different ideas, you're going to pick the best ones. So what sort of process getting inspiration not just from Kennedy and the missile crisis, but from dozens and dozens of situations, what sort of process are conducive to making the right decisions? What could you try if you wanted to make better decisions and to avoid cognitive biases in your organization tomorrow? There are literally dozens of things you could try, but I'm going to show you a few. When I was saying generate more options, one of the things that Kennedy um, said, or in fact, his brother Bob said, is let's put a bunch of smart guys in a room and kick them till they come up with better ideas. Basically, the ideas that the military was proposing to Kennedy were not good. They were saying either, you know, let's go to a confrontation and never mind if there's a war, or let's back down and never mind if we basically live under the threat of Soviet missiles. Obviously, neither of these options were very good. What mattered there was to generate more options. This is a reflex we don't always have. And that's something we could all do. Whenever people bring to you a choice between doing A and doing B, it feels like it would complicate things to say, well, what about C? But it's almost always a good idea to try. Whenever you have a choice between a choice that is a binary one, it's a good practice to generate more options, to go look for another idea, which could be a combination of the ideas that are proposed to you, or could be a completely different idea, but not to let yourself be trapped in a binary choice. That's the so-called vanishing options tactic. Imagine that the options that have been presented to you have vanished. What else could you do? Another example of a tool you could use is a variation on the principle of the devil's advocate. It's called red team, blue team. The best example of this is Warren Buffett. Uh, who needs no introduction, who says, whenever you are dealing with an investment bank that is telling you that you should do a deal, you should go hire a second investment bank and tell them you will only get paid if the deal does not happen. Because the first bank is only paid if the deal does happen. And Warren Buffett, in his inimitable style, calls this asking the barber whether you need a haircut. Basically, if you want an honest opinion, don't ask people who have a stake in the game, or if you do, ask people who have different stakes, have a blue team tell you, yes, you should do the deal, and then have a red team tell you, here's why you should not do the deal. And once you've heard both of them, well, then you can make an informed decision. Red team, blue team, it's like being the judge and saying, I've heard the prosecution, 
Now I'd like to hear the defense and then I can make a decision. But very often we actually only hear one side of the story, the team that is proposing something. For a third example, you probably remember this extraordinary and inspiring story of how Captain Sullenberger landed his Boeing or his Airbus actually on the Hudson River and saved all the passengers and crew members in a situation that was obviously desperate. When Sullenberger was asked after a few days when he refused to speak to the press because he said, yeah, I'm, I just did what I had to do, nothing to talk about. After a few days, he finally talked to the press and basically he said, look, what I did here is very simple and that's what any pilot would have done or at least should have done. I applied the checklist. Sullenberger speaks eloquently, as you see here, about the value of checklists as a way to make sure that you don't make avoidable stupid mistakes and as a way to encourage good communication and good leadership in a team of highly qualified people. Whenever we have an important decision to make, we should ask ourselves, could I develop a checklist ahead of time that would help me not miss something important in my decision process? So I've given you three simple examples. I'm going to skip this one. I've given you three simple examples of simple management tools, simple techniques that are going to be ways to embed process and collegiality in your decision making. Let me just summarize and wrap this up before I let you, uh, or before I answer the questions that I'm hoping many of you have already sent in the chat and that uh, Carolina and Yanju will uh, summarize to me in a minute after Nicola uh, asks his own questions. Just to summarize what we've covered, we have cognitive biases. We all have directionally wrong answers on questions like my little railroad road question or like my how well do you drive question. Those biases cause predictable mistakes. Uh, I could have told you about the failure of BlackBerry, which is another example of predictable mistake, but we're trying to keep some time for the discussion. Those mistakes are hard to correct because we're not aware of them at the time we're making them. As a result, we should get inspiration from people who have solved very difficult problems like Kennedy and his team and trust good process and good teams, collaboration and process to help us make the best possible decisions. With this, I will hand over to Nicola, I think, for questions and then to um, our team in HEC to synthesize the questions from the floor, which I would be delighted to answer. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Olivier. Uh, your speech is a mix of inspiring and clearly scary. So that, that, that's uh, what makes it so unique. Um, it's, um, it's like watching a movie um, and um, it, it's really fascinating. So thanks a lot for that. Um, each and every time I learn, um, and each and every time um, it, it uh, uh, forced me to plunge into my own bias um, and, and uh, the, the history of my career. So uh, th that's really interesting. So first of all, um, I'll be happy to, uh, to welcome um, uh, Nicolas Boucater, who may be Nicolas uh, uh, would have some uh, questions for you. Thank you so much, Nicola. Olivier, this was very inspiring as usual. Thanks a million. Um, I don't know how to start, but I have a question that pops into my mind. At the moment, as you know, we are living and facing unprecedented uh, difficult situation in Lebanon and are probably being influenced by group thinking, negativity, overconfidence, or maybe negative confidence, social pressure, like we were saying. Um, and, and an anchoring process may be emphasized by, by, by fake news surrounding everything that's happening at the moment. Um, two quick questions. Uh, the first one, is there a model uh, to know which one of the tools that you presented would be the best to choose? Uh, and the second question would be, uh, do we have to look at the answers, uh, the answers to our questions outside the sphere of people living in the crisis itself? So should we go outside of the crisis with people living abroad and uh, get some answers? Uh, let me start with the second question because it's, um, it's easier. I don't know. <laughs> so that's, that's an easy answer. Um, I, I don't know. And it depends as, as a rule, as a rule of how to solve difficult problems, 
it's always a good idea to have several lenses on a problem, to have several different ways to look at it. So I can imagine that if you're looking for solutions to the problem of Lebanon, um, getting ideas and inputs from a lot of places would be good. The problem here is one of governance, obviously. At some point, you need to have a process to actually resolve uh, the, the situation, which leads me to your first question. How would you know which tools to use? So um, I'm, I'm going to be very uh, humble here. I don't have tools that are going to solve every problem in the world. There is no such thing. What we, we can propose here, based on an understanding of how people sometimes make mistakes, is for anyone who is in a position to make decision, and let's assume that the governance is right there, how can you avoid being tripped by your own biases? So the perspective I'm adopting here is, let's say, Nicola, that you run your company and you have your management team and you've got decisions to make. The one who needs to worry about these biases is you. You need to worry about how your own biases could lead you astray in your own decisions and how you're going to help your team make help your team help you to make the right decisions. Now, if I'm looking at this from the perspective of one member of your team, and my perspective is Nicola is my boss, and I need to tell Nicola that he's got biases because he's about to make mistakes, that's not going to work because you're not going to listen to me. Because when I come to you and I say, oh, you are overconfident, Nicola, you're going to think, well, Olivier is being negative. He's always like that, actually. He's always pessimistic. We would never get anything done if we listen to Olivier, right? Because from your perspective, well, you don't see your biases. So the start of the process has got to be the leader himself or herself who says, I want to get better at this. I want to make better decisions and I need the help of others around me to help me make better decisions. Once that is the setup, and to go back to come back to your earlier answer, it's up to the leader, given a situation, given a type of decision, and given a team composition and a certain culture in an organization, to decide which tools might work and which tools might not. Let me take an example, which I gave you, the red team and blue team. Some of the people I work with, some of the organizations I know say, Oh, that's a great idea. Let's start it tomorrow morning. We absolutely need that. Others are horrified. They say, what? You mean you would, want to, you would want us to have two separate teams look at the same problem? That's a waste of time and money. And then you would want them to both come to the same management meeting and to argue against each other. But they would, you know, that would create a lot of tension, a lot of adversarial dy dynamics. And they wouldn't want that, and we wouldn't want that. We want to stay friends, right? And I have a lot of respect for that. And there are other ways to encourage the expression of ideas that are less adversarial. Now, why am I telling you this story? Because this illustrates that as the leader of a group that would want to make a decision on something like this, some of your skill, some of your insight would have to be to pick the right techniques, the ones that are going to be acceptable culturally in your organization in order to achieve the goals of collaboration and process that I'm highlighting here. So it's not an exact science. It's, a, it's an art. It's a skill. There are lots of techniques. I've given you three examples, but in the book I wrote about that, I listed 40. And in fact, it's just a selection. I could name you 80 or 100. And every time I run a workshop on this, people generate more. So it's not hard to come up with ideas of how to encourage collaboration and how to have good process in decision meetings and decision processes. What is hard is to have the humility as a leader to say, I need to do this and it has to come from me because if it comes from others, I'm not going to be listening to them. So sorry for the long-winded answer, but that was a very rich question. I wanted to give it a full, uh, as full an answer as possible. Thank you so much. Thank you, Olivier. And th there's one question uh, uh, which has been asked in, in different manners. So I'm going to try to uh, to make the same thesis. Um, we are living more and more in a society where data um, is is increasingly important. And I'm talking about the data. I'm talking about machine learning. I'm talking about deep learning. 
Um, so, so we have a, a lot um, of data that, uh, that, that we can use, but how um, can we deal with people who reject the data-driven decisions? Yeah, I mean, I was uh, I was about to to answer when you said we're living in a world where data is more and more important. That in fact, the the real problem I think we're facing is that we have a lot of situations in which the data is less and less important, and where the proliferation of data is actually exploited by people who want to pick and choose the data that they look at in order to support what they believe. So the the key bias here that is at work is a very important one, which I haven't covered, uh, which is called confirmation bias. When we have something in mind, we're going to find all kinds of reasons to support what we already believe. And the more data is available, the easier it becomes to selectively look at the data that confirms what we believe and to ignore the data that says the opposite. If I'm looking at the COVID-19 crisis today, and I think that governments in uh, Western Europe are overreacting and that they shouldn't be doing anything and that in fact all the curfews and lockdowns are killing the economy and not having any impact, well, I can find data to support that view. I would need to pick a very biased selection of data, but it's not hard to find it. More importantly, I can lock, no, not more importantly, then once I've done that, I can lock myself inside a group of like-minded people and I can do nothing but exchange information with those people on Facebook and WhatsApp and Twitter and so on, until we're blue in the face, reinforcing one another with our confirmation biases and our groupthink. So I think one of the problems we have with the proliferation of data in the world is that we have let the, the way we exchange information, uh, and especially the social networks, put this data to very bad use. Uh, and I think this is you know, I, I, I hate to, to use superlatives, but I, I'm afraid this might be the most severe problem facing our democracies. Uh, and it's a real peril to democracy. When we don't share a basic belief in the same facts, it's going to be very hard to agree on anything when it comes to making decisions. If we don't believe in the same data, you know, you, there's an old saying by an American politician that you're entitled to your, everyone is entitled to their own opinion, but not to their own facts, right? And that should be the basis of rational debate in a democracy. We now live in a world where de facto, everyone is entitled to their own facts. You can live in a world of your own facts and your own data that is completely separate from my world of facts and data. And we simply will not be able to find common ground on anything because we don't agree on the basic facts. So that is a very, very dangerous situation. I don't think it can be resolved in the current legal framework with which we are dealing with the social networks. I think personally that we need to uh, change the way we're dealing with those uh, institutions. And that if we don't do something uh, before it's too late, it will be the end of democracy. I'm sorry to be uh, somber about this, but uh, I simply don't see how we can live in a world where everyone is entitled to their own facts. Okay, yeah, yeah. So information is also really important. There's another question which is connected to the social bias or the overconfidence bias. And, and it's how would you factor in the personal risk we are taking? So, so what is the, the, the importance of the personal risk that we can take um, to, to overcome such bias? So um, the notion of risk is a very interesting one when it comes to biases, because there is often um, a perception or you know, a, a misperception, I should say, but in, 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 in half an hour, it's difficult to cover everything, that um, when I speak of biases, I'm telling people to take less risk. That is actually not what I'm saying, right? When I'm giving the example of overconfidence and I'm saying many people overestimate themselves, that doesn't mean that they should not overestimate themselves and that, it would, and, and that they should therefore take less risk. What I'm simply saying is be aware of what you're doing. If you want to take risks, suit yourself. It's your life, it's your money, it's your business, or maybe it's not, but it, I'm, I'm assuming it is. If you want to take risks yourself with your 
own life at your own risk, as the saying goes. It's entirely up to you. Rational decision making does not say that you should not take risks. It's rational to take risks, the right risks. What is not rational is to take risks that you're not aware of. It's to underestimate the risks. Now, overconfidence and other biases lead us to often, not always, but to often underestimate the level of risk that we're taking. For instance, a very common way in which you see big organizations, especially big companies, make risky decisions is by somehow fooling themselves into beginning that it's not risky, into believing that it's not risky. Very often when you actually look at a presentation, it will have a slide at the end that says, okay, so in this project, which we've now explained to you for 50 pages, we are of course aware of the risks. Here are the risks. And here are all the mitigation plans that we have in front of all the risks. And what that slide and the tone of the people presenting it is supposed to mean is, you can bet on this proposition with your eyes closed, it's safe, there is no risk. This is what I call deluding yourself or fooling yourself into believing there is no risk. What a healthy organization should be doing in that situation is not pretend that there is no risk and that therefore we should do it with our eyes closed. It's to say, there is a risk. We know there is a risk. We want to take that risk because we are in the business of taking risks. We're in the business of making bets. We know that the surest way of failing is not to take risks. And therefore we are going to take that risk. The reason we're taking it is because the benefits, if it succeeds, are very well worth the risk. So let's go take the risk, which by the way, means that if we fail, if the person who is proposing this plan comes back in a year's time and says, it didn't work, we will not tell that person, well, you're a loser and you're a fake because you told us it was risk-free and then it failed. We will say, well, it was a risk worth taking and it failed, but if we had to do it again, we would because we were conscious of the risks at the time and therefore we are giving you a right to fail, a right to failure. When people speak of having a right to failure and recognizing the right to fail, that's what it should mean. It should mean that we have a right to fail because we are intentionally taking risks. And when we are taking risks, we recognize that there is a possibility of failure. So the role of risk in rational decision-making is very important to answer your initial question, Nicola. And the role of risk is that we should be consciously aware of the risks that we are taking. We should be explicit in setting the appetite that we have for risk. And once we have taken risks, we should celebrate the people who have taken risks, whether they have succeeded or failed. Because if you accept the, the idea that you are taking risks, you should also accept the idea of failure. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to answer a question that, that we will probably have um, uh, for all the participants. You will receive an email uh, with the last publications um, of uh, Olivier. And notably, I cannot advise you uh, more than reading uh, a book that I, that I absolutely loved and which is uh, you're about to make a huge mistake. It's, it's a, a phenomenal mistake, book. Yes. It's uh, terrible, it's, sorry, yeah. Terrible you're about to mistake. make a terrible mistake in English. Et vous allez commettre une terrible erreur for our French speaking uh, yes. audience. That, that's absolutely fantastic. So it's going to be my, uh, maybe my last question. It's going to be a very practical one, I think. So um, it is how to make people realize they have bias. Uh, my answer might surprise you, Nicolas, but I wouldn't start there. I wouldn't, you know, it's, no one wants to be told that they have biases. Um, no one wants to be, you know, uh, uh, finger pointed at and told, ah, you have biases. That's not productive. It gets people on the defensive. What you want to do, if you are aware of your own biases, and you should start with yourself, is say, look, I have biases. By the way, you may have biases too. If you want to learn about them, learn about them, but that's none of my business. What I want to do myself is become a better decision maker. And I want your help to help me be a better decision maker. And the way we're going to do that is we're going to put in place better decision-making processes. You see, 
implicit in your question and in the question of all the people who are asking about biases is a belief that if I find out about my biases, if I become aware of them, then I can improve. Unfortunately, as I showed you with the little checkerboard, that is not the case. Being aware of my biases, I think I'm pretty aware of what the biases are, right? I mean, I'm, I'm writing books about them. I've been studying them for 10 years. I'm every bit as biased as I was 10 years ago. I make exactly every mistake that everybody else makes. I am as subject to confirmation bias and groupthink and overconfidence as the next person. Knowing about biases doesn't make the biases go away. So learning about biases, you know, I, I teach about biases. It's a bit odd for me to say you don't need to learn about them, but really you don't. It's not going to change your life. It's interesting, I think, but it's not going to change your life. What is going to change your life for the better is if you as a person say, I want to make better decisions. And because those biases are there, mine and other people's, we need to change the way we make decisions. We need to change the decision-making process that is going to result in better decisions. As a final word, perhaps, Nicola, just to echo this, because this, this is a story that sticks. Many, many years ago, when the first thinkers about cognitive biases, Kahneman and Versky, were starting to write about this and to say people are rational, they have biases, they make predictable mistakes, everything I've been telling you about today, there was initially a huge pushback against that. Right? And what I'm telling you is you know, relatively common knowledge today, at least in academic circles. But at the time, the dominant school of thought was that people were rational and that if they made mistake, it could only be because they were stupid or careless or you know, inferior and the market would take care of that eventually. And in exasperation, one day in a conference, an academic asked them, well, if we're so biased, if we have all those problems, if we make all those mistakes so systematically, how did we make it to the moon, right? If human beings are so flawed, how do they make it to the moon? And the answer to that question that should inspire us all is it's not a single person who made it to the moon. It's a huge organization called NASA, right? If you can build an organization that decides as rationally and as effectively as those very big science-driven organizations, and by the way, they make their own mistakes and they learn from them too, and they have their own biases and they learn from them too. We could talk about some of those stories, but your, your mission as a leader is not just to be a good leader who makes good decisions. It's not to be an omniscient leader who is aware of his own biases and able to overcome them. That won't happen. It's to build an organization that is able to make good decisions and is going to be able to do things that no human being on his own would be able to do, not even yourself. Okay, so I'm going to keep on living with my own bias. I'm going so to cherish will. them. And I'm going to work, uh, I understand, uh, through collaboration, uh, trust, um, and transparency uh, with my team to make the best decision possible. Olivier, Thank you very much for your time. And I'm now handing over to the real boss of this call, who is Carolina. Many thanks, Olivier. Many thanks, Nicola. Uh, I think we have now reached the end of the webinar. HCC Paris would like to thank you for taking part in this conference. And we hope you can join us for our other webinars. The next one will take place on October 29 at 5 p.m. Central European time with Thomas Michalski on dealing with sovereign default. Until then, please keep well. Thank you for your attention. Merci beaucoup. Merci beaucoup, Olivier. Merci à vous. Merci, Olivier. C'était très intéressant. On a enregistré les commentaires, si jamais ça, ça intéresse Olivier euh, de les avoir. Oui, si vous pouvez me les envoyer, ce serait super. Oui, okay. oui, oui. j'ai déjà enregistré tout, donc je vais vous envoyer euh, plus tard. Super, merci à, à vous. Merci à vous, on a voyagé dans l'espace grâce à votre discours. <rire> ça fait réfléchir sur ces biais. Allez, bonne soirée à tous. Oui. Au revoir. Au revoir. Au revoir.